Let's turn to Judges, chapter 19. As we mentioned, from chapter 17 to the end of the book of Judges are more or less an appendix to the book. They do not follow a chronological order. They are just giving you little insights to the conditions of the nation at this particular period of their history. And so we have two stories. Both of them involve Levites or priests from the area of Mount Ephraim. In both of them there is a corruption of the priesthood. And when you have a corruption of the priesthood, then you have really gotten about as low as a nation can get from a moral standpoint. You have come to rock bottom. The emphasis over and over again in these appendixes is pointing out the fact that there was no king in Israel. That it was a period of anarchy. For everyone was doing that which was right in his own sight. It was a period in which existential philosophy had its opportunity to uh, show itself in the practice of life. And we see how morally debased the people had become. And there was no king in Israel. Now, it was God's intent that he be the king over this nation. That they should be a nation unlike any other nation on the face of the earth. For they were to be a nation that were ruled by God. He was to be king over Israel. But they had rejected God's rule. They had rejected God's law. There was no central government to enforce the laws of God. And so we see how morally corrupt the nation had become and was at this particular time. So in chapter 19, we have the second of the two stories that just give us a picture of the moral conditions of the nation at this particular period of their history. And it is significant that chapter 19 begins with the recognition again that there was no king in Israel at this particular time. And verse 25 of chapter 21 ends the same way. So this whole little story is prefaced by the fact that there was no king in Israel. Every man was doing that which was right in his own eyes. So uh, we have now the story in between this preface. These are the conditions. No king in Israel. Everyone doing that which was right in his own eyes. And so there was a certain Levite who was sojourning or living in the area of Mount Ephraim who took him a concubine out of Bethlehem, Judah. Now a concubine was as a wife, but without all of the privileges of a wife. The concubine, his concubine, played the whore against him, went away from him to her father's house, back to Bethlehem, Judah, and was there for four whole months. So her husband, the Levite, arose and went after her to speak friendly unto her, and to bring her again, having his servant with him, and a couple of donkeys, and... Uh, she brought him into her father's house, and when the father of the damsel saw him, he rejoiced to meet him. And so, uh, you have the case of an unfaithful wife who returned to her parents' house, and the husband is out for reconciliation. 
And he comes down to Bethlehem, Judah, and she introduces him to her father, and there is a glad meeting. The father-in-law, the damsel's father, his father-in-law retained him, and he stayed with him for three days. And they did eat and drink, and he lodged there. It came to pass on the fourth day, when they arose early in the morning, that he rose up to depart, and the damsel's father said unto her son and to his son-in-law, Comfort your heart with a morsel of bread, and afterward go your way. And so they sat down and did eat and drink, both of them together. For the damsel's father had said unto the man, Be content, I pray thee, and spend the night, and let your heart be merry. And so when the man rose up to depart, his father-in-law urged him, therefore he lodged there again. And he arose early in the morning of the fifth day to depart. The damsel's father said, Oh, comfort your heart, I pray thee. And they tarried until the afternoon, and they did both of them eat. And when the man rose up to depart, he and his concubine and his servant, his father-in-law, the damsel's father, said unto him, Behold, now the day is drawing toward evening. I pray, tarry all night. Uh, behold, uh, let your heart be merry, and tomorrow get an early start on your way that you may go home. But he would not tarry. That night he rose up and departed and came over near Jabus, which is Jerusalem. And there was with him the two donkeys, Saddle and his concubine. And when they were by Jebus, the day was far spent. The servant said unto his master, Come, I pray thee, let's turn into this city, the Jebusites, and let's stay in it. The master said unto him, We will not turn aside hither into the city of a stranger that is not of the children of Israel. We will pass over to Gibeah. Now, they got a late start from the girl's dad's house in Bethlehem of Judah. It's about five miles from Bethlehem to Jerusalem. But at this time, Jerusalem was occupied by the Jebusites. It was not until the time of King David that the city was taken from the Jebusites and occupied by Israel. And so the servant is getting evening and he gave a wise suggestion, you know, let's, let's turn in here for the night. And he said, no, they're strangers. I don't want to abide in the city or stay in a city which is not an Israelite city. And so they went on from Jerusalem to Gibeah, which is probably another two and a half to three miles beyond Jerusalem, towards Ramah. It was too late to journey all the way to Ramah. The sun was now setting when they came to Gibeah. And so they decided to spend the night in Gibeah. And so they passed on and went their way. The sun went down upon them when they were by Gibeah, which belongs to the tribe of Benjamin. And so they turned aside to go in and to lodge in Gibeah. And when he went in, he sat down in the street of the city, for there was no man that took them into his house for lodging. Now in those days, they did not have Motel 6s. They did not have the travel lodges or uh, any types of hotels or that type of accommodation where you could go and pay money and spend the night. Hospitality was a very major part of life and a very important part. And uh, people had certain rules concerning hospitality and it was very important to them to be hospitable to the traveler. Even to the present day, among the Bedouins, they have strict rules concerning hospitality. If you receive a guest into your home, you are honor bound to protect him and to shelter him as long as he is under your roof. Now you may hate him and want to kill him, but you'll never kill him while he's your guest. You wait till he leaves. <laughs> but as long as he is under your roof, 
you are honor bound to entertain him, to treat him royally, and to defend him. Not to show hospitality was a great sin. And so the people of Gibeah were not hospitable to this man, his wife and his servant. They were sitting there in the streets of the city. No one took them into their house for lodging. And there came an old man from his work out of the field at evening. He also was from Mount Ephraim. But he was staying there in Gibeah. The men of the place were Benjamites. He was an Ephraimite, this old man. And when he lifted up his eyes and he saw this wayfaring man in the street of the city, and the old man said, Where are you going and where have you come from? And he said unto him, We are passing from Bethlehem, Judah, toward the site of Mount Ephraim, because I am from there. And I went to Bethlehem, Judah, but I am now going to the house of the Lord, and there is no man who has received me into his house. Yet we have enough straw and food for our donkeys. There is bread and wine for me and for my handmaid and for the young man, your servants. We don't lack anything. We have enough. The old man said unto him, Peace be with thee, howsoever, let all your wants lie upon me, only don't stay in the street. So the old man invited him into the house, and he brought him, and he gave him provender for the donkeys. They washed their feet, they did eat and drink. Now as they were making their hearts merry, behold the men of the city, certain sons of Belial, encircled the house, and they beat the door, they spoke to the master of the house, the old man, saying, Bring forth the man that came into your house, that we may know him. And the man, the master of the house, went out unto them and said unto them, Nay, my brethren, I pray you, do not so wickedly, seeing that this man has come into my house, do not this folly. Now we have a scene that is very reminiscent of what happened in Sodom. You remember when the two angels of the Lord came to Sodom on the mission of God to destroy the city because of the wickedness that had come up before God in heaven. And when these two men were received by Lot into Lot's house, the men of Sodom in the evening encircled the house and demanded that Lot send these two men outside that they might actually have homosexual relationships with them. God destroyed Sodom because of this sin. But here the same thing is now happening only in an Israelite city among the tribe of Benjamin. The same heinous sin that perpetrated the destruction of Sodom is now happening among God's people. The moral decay into which the nation had sunk is obvious and evident here. As the homosexuals of the city are so brazen as to openly parade themselves in the streets of the city and demand their rights, which are not really rights at all. The old man recognizes it as, weak, as wickedness and as folly. Don't do this wickedness. Don't do this folly. Now, because of the custom of hospitality and because women in that culture and time had very little rights. The man did something that is quite unthinkable to us. It's hard for us to uh, relate to this because our culture is so entirely different. You see, our culture has been vastly affected by the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
And one thing that the gospel of Jesus Christ has declared and has promoted is equal rights. Recognizing women as equal with men in the sight of God. For in Christ there is neither male nor female. We are all one together in Him. And the Bible in the New Testament did so much to elevate the place of the woman, giving honor unto the woman, and demanding respect for the woman. And now as the years of Christian influence has affected our culture, we have such a high regard for the women. However, as the pagan influences begin to prevail in our society, we see that women again are being degraded by a society that is trying to push out Christ and push out Christianity and the Christian influence. And as it does, women are again just being made a chattel, an object of something for man to lust after and to gratify himself uh, by his lust after her. And so all of the pornography and the exploitation of the woman's body uh, and uh, the, the horrible degrading of a woman through pornography and all, uh, bestiality and, and uh, sadomasochism and so forth, horrible, horrible things are planted in the minds of men. And, and the woman's place of Honor and respect and glory and modesty is, is rapidly disappearing. And it is something that is of deep concern to me. Uh, because uh, human nature being what it is, if this continues, if the Christian influence continues to wane in our whole social order, you women are going to find yourselves back where you were. Just looked upon as an object for the gratification of a man's sexual lust. The man said, look, here's my daughter. She's a virgin. And here's the man's concubine. I will bring them out to you and humble them and do with them whatever seems good to you. But don't do such a vile thing to this man. Now you see, that's hard for us to understand, isn't it? A man willing to sacrifice his daughter, give the wife, but, you know, don't touch the fellow. That's the world without the influence of Christianity. That is the world without a king. The lawlessness, the world without the law. Without moral principles to govern them. And so we see, even among the tribes of Israel, among the tribe of Benjamin, this horrible, horrible sin. The men would not hearken to him. So the men took his concubine. They brought her forth unto them. And they raped her and abused her all night until morning. And when the day began to dawn, they let her go. And the woman came in the dawning of the day, fell down at the door of the man's house where her Lord was, until it was light. And her Lord, the Levite, rose up in the morning, opened the door of the house, went out to go his way, and behold, the woman, his concubine, was fallen down at the door of the house. Her hands were upon the threshold. He said unto her, Up, let's get going. Great compassion. Get up, woman, let's go. But there was no answer. And so the man took her up upon the donkey, and he rose up and got unto his place. And then when he was come into his house, he took a knife, laid hold of his concubine, and divided her body with her bones into twelve pieces and sent them into all of the coast of Israel. And it was so that when all those that saw it there was no such a deed done nor seen from that day. And the children of Israel came out of the land of Egypt unto this day. Consider it and take advice and speak your mind. So he sent out a message. Hey, consider this. Speak your mind. Let's gather together. 
So all of the children of Israel went out of the... And the congregation was gathered together as one man from the tribes all the way from Dan to the north to Beersheba in the south with the land of Gilead unto the Lord in Mizpah. Great gathering of the children of Israel. And the chiefs of all of the people, even of all the tribes of Israel, presented themselves in the assembly of the people of God, 400,000 footmen that drew the sword. The armies gathered. Now the children of Benjamin heard that the children of Israel were gone up to Mizpah. And then they said the, then said the children of Israel, tell us how was this wickedness. And so they're examining now the situation. Tell us what happened. And the Levite, the husband of the woman that was slain, answered and said, I came to Gibeah that belongs to Benjamin. I and my concubine to lodge. And the men of Gibeah rose against me and beset the house round about uh, by night, and they would have slain me and my concubine. They have forced that she is dead. And so I took my concubine and cut her in pieces and sent her throughout all the country of the inheritance of Israel, for they have committed lewdness and folly in Israel. Now, you see the words and the adjectives that are used to describe the sin of homosexuality. The lewdness, the folly, the wickedness. Such a vile thing, he says. Behold, you are all children of Israel. Give your advice and counsel. And all the people rose as one, saying, We will not any of us go to his tent Neither will we any of us turn into our own houses. But now this shall be the thing which we will do to Gibeah. We will go up by lot against it. We'll go up and punish them. And we will take ten men of the hundred throughout all the tribes of Israel, a hundred of a thousand and a thousand of ten thousand, to gather together the food for the people, that they may do when they come to Gibeah of a Benjamin according to all the folly that they have wrought in Israel. So the men of Israel were gathered against the city and they were knit together as one man. The tribes of Israel sent men throughout all the tribe of Benjamin saying, What wickedness is this that you have done among you? Deliver the men, the children of Belial, which are in Gibeah, that we may put them to death and put away the e evil from Israel. But the children of Benjamin would not hearken to the voice of their brothers, the children of Israel. But the children of Benjamin gathered themselves together out of the cities of Gibeah to go to battle against the children of Israel. The children of Benjamin were numbered at that time out of the cities, 26,000 men that drew sword beside the inhabitants of Gibeah, which were numbered 700 chosen men. And among all this people, there were 700 chosen men left-handed. Everyone could sling stones at a hair's breadth and not miss. The guys with these sling stones, they could, with the slings, you can sling a stone up to about a pound. But these guys were accurate. They could not miss it more than a hair's breadth, their target with these sling stones. The men of Israel, beside Benjamin, were numbered 400,000 that drew the sword these were all men of war. So you have the 26,000 men of Benjamin, but they're facing tremendous odds, the 400,000 of the men of Israel. The children of Israel arose, went up to the house of God and asked counsel of God and said, Which of us shall go up first to battle against the children of Benjamin? And the Lord said, Judah shall go up first. So they went up to inquire of the Lord. Now notice, when they inquired of the Lord... It would seem to me their first question should have been, shall we go up? But there was a presumption here, which shall go up first? I think that oftentimes we offer to God sort of a multiple choice kind of a thing. But many times we even limit God in that because we may not even put on the list what God wants. 
We say, God, shall I do this or that? And maybe neither of them is correct. Better to say, God, what shall I do? Rather than giving God the, the alternatives, you know, this or that. Uh, when in the New Testament, before the Holy Spirit had descended upon the church, and they had then the direct guidance of the Holy Spirit in the affairs of the church, Peter, in talking to the disciples, said, You know, Judas has committed suicide. We need someone to take his place who can be numbered among the apostles. We need a fellow who has been with us all the while from the time of Jesus' baptism who can also bear witness of his resurrection. So they chose Matthias and was it Justice Matthias? Barsabas. And they said, Lord, which of the two of these fellows do you want? And they drew lots. And the lot fell on Matthias. Well, in reality, neither of the two God wanted. But they gave God the choice of the two. Lord, which of us should go up first? There's a presumption here. We are to go up. I think that had they said, Lord, shall we go up? They would not have had the defeat before the Benjamites that they experienced. Now, their cause was right. The Benjamites should be punished for this horrible sin. What they were doing was right. They were being God's instruments of judgment upon Benjamin. That was correct. But they weren't seeking the Lord as to the method and the manner by which they should go. A lot of times we say, hey, the cause is right. Let's do something. And we can get involved in reactionary kind of situations where we are reacting to an evil in the community, but maybe not according to the plan of God. Someone gets an idea. Hey, let's go do this. Oh, oh yeah, that's a good cause. Let's, let's get involved. And yet, we're not seeking the Lord as to how and the methods. In other words, here's something that needs to be done. Let's do it. Well, yes, it needs to be done. But let's seek the Lord in how to do it. It isn't everything that I just have a right cause. That is not justification for action. The justification for action is that God has led me into this activity. We must make sure that we are led by the Spirit of God even in the right things that we seek to do. Because it is very possible, and the Scripture is full of examples, of people who sought to do the right thing in a wrong way. And were not blessed of God. Because they were not following God's pattern or God's plan. I think that one of the most important lessons that we can, need to learn. Is not to develop a plan and then try and get God on our side. But seek to find the mind and the will and the plan of God. And then go at it according to God's plan. It's so easy for us to size up a situation. We say, look, something has to be done. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it has to be done. We need to do something here. And okay, what shall we do? Well, let's do this. Yeah, let's... And, and you know, you, you get together and you devise a plan, but you don't seek the wisdom and the counsel of God in the thing. 
Now we've got the thing all set. The program's all ready to go. And, and we say, you know, now Lord bless our program. I am convinced that our concern for the moral decay in our society is not nearly as great as God's concern. I am convinced that our concern for evangelism of our area is not nearly as great as God's concern for evangelism for our area. And I am also convinced that God has a plan to reach the community. Now, what is important is that we wait upon God and discover His plan. And then we work together with God according to His plan. Rather than saying our community needs to be reached. Let's do this. Let's do that. Let's organize together a committee and let's, you know, reach our community by doing this, that, and the other. No, our community needs to be reached, yes. God, you have a plan. You have just as great a concern for this community as we do. God, show us what is your plan. That we might, Lord, yield ourselves as instruments to accomplish your will and your plan for this community. And not only must the cause be right, but actually the way we approach the remedy must be guided of the Lord. They presumed. Surely God wants us to go up and, and, you know, wipe out the Benjamites for this horrible sin. Which of us shall go up first? And so the Lord said, Judah. And the men of Israel arose in the morning and encamped against Gibeah. They went to battle against Benjamin. The men of Israel put themselves in array to fight against them at Gibeah. And the children of Benjamin came forth out of Gibeah and destroyed down to the ground of the Israelites that day 22,000 men. I mean, the Benjamites thoroughly routed them. And the people, the men of Israel, encouraged themselves. They set their battle again in array in the place where they put themselves in array the first day. And the children of Israel went up and wept before the Lord even until evening. And they asked counsel of the Lord again, saying, Shall I go up again to battle against the children of Benjamin, my brother? And the Lord said, Go up against him. So this time they said, Shall we go? The Lord answered, Yes. And the children of Israel came near again to the children of Benjamin the second day. And Benjamin went out against them and destroyed down to the ground of the children of Israel 18,000 men, all that drew the sword. And then all of the children of Israel and all of the people went up and they came to the house of God and they wept and they sat there before the Lord and they fasted that day until evening and they offered the burnt offerings and the peace offerings before the Lord. And the children of Israel inquired of the Lord for the ark of the coming of the Lord was there in those days. And Phinehas, the son of Eliezer, the son of Aaron, stood before it in those days saying, Shall I yet go again to battle against the children of Benjamin, my brother, or shall I cease? And the Lord said, Go up, for tomorrow I will deliver them into your hand. Now, this time they waited upon God. They fasted, they prayed, and they got more than just a yes or no answer. This time they got the directions from God. Yes, go up, and tomorrow I will deliver them into your hand. So the Israelites sent men on the opposite side of Gibeah to uh, lie in wait actually to hide and the children of Israel went up against the children of Benjamin on the third day they put themselves in their battle formations against Gibeah as the other two days the children of Benjamin came out against the people and they were drawn away from the city they began to smite the people and to kill them as at other times in the highways on the way back to uh 
Shiloh, to the house of God. And they killed about 30 men. And the children of Benjamin said, They are smitten down before us as at the first. But the children of Israel said, Let us flee and draw them from the city into the highways. And all the men of Israel rose up out of their place, and they put themselves in array at Baal Tamer. And the liars in wait of Israel came forth out of their places, even out of the meadows of Gibeah. They came against Gibeah, 10,000 chosen men out of all of Israel. The battle was fierce. But they knew not that evil was near them, that near them, that is the Benjamites. And the Lord smote Benjamin before Israel, the children of Israel, destroyed of the Benjamites that day, 25,000 and a hundred men, all of these that drew the sword. So the children of Benjamin saw that they were smitten, for the men of Israel gave place to the Benjamites, because they trusted in the layers in wait which they had set beside Gibeah. And the layers in wait hasted. And they rushed upon Gibeah. And the liars in wait drew themselves along and smote all the city with the edge of the sword. So they drew the people out. These fellows on the other side in uh, hiding came out, took the city. There was nothing but women and children there. And they wiped out the city with the edge of the sword. And there was an appointed sign between the men of Israel and those who were uh, lying in ambush, that they should make a great flame with smoke rise up out of the city. And when the men of Israel were retreating from the battle, Benjamin began to smite and kill of the men of Israel, about 30 persons. And they said, Surely they are smitten down before us as at the first battle. But when the flames began to rise out of the city with a pillar of smoke, the Benjamites looked behind them, and behold, the flame of the city ascended up to heaven. And when the men of Israel turned again, the men of Benjamin were Amazed, They saw that evil was come upon them. Therefore they turned their backs to the men of Israel unto the way of the wilderness. But the battle overtook them, and they that came out of the cities were destroyed in the midst of them. And thus they encircled the Benjamites, and they chased them and trod them down with ease over against Gibeah toward the sun rising. And there fell of Benjamin 18,000 men. All of these were men of valor. And they turned and fled toward the wilderness into the rock of Rimmon. And they gleaned of them in the highways 5,000 men and pursued hard after them unto uh, Gidom. And they slew 2,000 of them there. So that all that fell that day of Benjamin were 25,000 men that drew the sword. All of these were men of valor. But 600 men turned and fled to the wilderness into the rock Rimmon and abode in the rock Rimmon for four months. And the men of Israel turned again upon the children of Benjamin smote them with the edge of the sword, as well as the men of every city, as the beast and all that came to hand, and they set fire to all the cities they came to. The tribe of Benjamin was virtually wiped out. They came to all the cities, destroyed them, burned them with fire, taking vengeance against the Benjamites for the sin. Uh, the sin was really limited at first just to the evil men. But then it spread to the rest of the tribe because they refused action in delivering the evil men for judge, judgment. And in so doing, were condoning their actions. And so God brought judgment upon the whole tribe for the condoning of the actions of these evil men. Now the men of Israel had sworn in Mizpah saying, None of us will give his daughter unto a Benjamite for a wife. And the people came to the house of God, and they abode there before God, and lifted up their voices, and they wept sore. And they said, O Lord God of Israel, why has this come to pass in Israel, that there should be today one tribe lacking in Israel? And it came to pass on the morrow that the people rose early and built there an altar, and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings. Now, they're having a remorse over the whole thing. They come back and, and they think, oh my, we're going to be lacking a tribe in Israel. You know, there's only 600 men left, but we've all sworn that we won't let them marry our daughters. That means the tribe of Benjamin, Benjamin is going to be exterminated. And so there was, they, they got to thinking about this and it was a, a thing that really got to them. They wept before God. Oh, there's going to be a tribe missing. Now, again, rather than seeking God's solution, they take actions into their own hands. And 
Um, again, we find the case of, of making a, a vow that just got them in trouble. It wasn't but a few weeks ago that we studied the vow of Jephthah, you remember. That horrible vow, and, and it just created problems. <laughs> the Bible really warns us against making vows. And sort of discourages the taking of vows before God. It isn't necessary to promise God that you're going to do something in order to obtain God's favor. In fact, you're more apt to receive from God not promising that you'll do something for Him, but just upon the mercy of God and the grace of God come upon that premise, you're more apt to receive from God than you are by promising God, God, this is what I'm going to do for you. If you'll just do this for me, Lord, this is what I'm going to do for you. But people seem to have a concept that I've got to make God some kind of Tremendous promise, you know, in order to get God to work in my behalf. Not so. Not at all. God loves you. And God's grace is manifested towards us. And what God does for you, He does on the basis of His grace, not on the basis of my merit or worth. But the making of a vow sort of puts it on to me, you see. God, I'll be worthy. I'll do this wonderful thing for you. And, and thus I'll be sort of deserving and worthy. And so, Lord, reward me for, you know, this wonderful thing I, I plan to do for you if you'll just do this for me. And, and you're trying to bargain with God. Not necessary. Far more apt to receive if you'll just come strictly on the basis of God's grace. Lord, be merciful to me. And... Just trusting God to work in your behalf, though you know you're not deserving or worthy. I find that taking a vow is, in a sense, to trust in my flesh. Telling God that I'm going to be worthy. Lord, I'm going to do better. If you just will help me now, I promise, Lord, this is what I'll do for you. These men made, again, a, a, a foolish vow. God, you know, we won't let any of our daughters marry these guys. Now, having made a foolish vow, they do even a more foolish thing in order to cover the vow. The children of Israel were sorry for the tribe of Benjamin, their brother. And they said, one tribe is cut off this day. What should we do for wives? For those that remain, seeing we have sworn by the Lord, we will not give them our daughters to wives. So we've made this dumb vow. Rather than saying, Lord, that was a stupid vow, we're sorry, you know, forgive us. They, they're going to commit evil to cover for the dumb vow. They said, is there any of the tribes of Israel that did not come to Mizpah. In other words, were any of the cities not represented? Because if they weren't represented, they weren't there when we made the vow. And they said, Hey, no one came from the camp of Jabesh Gilead to the assembly. For the people were numbered, and behold, they took the census, and uh, they numbered off the tribes and so forth. There was no... One there, there were no inhabitants from Jabesh Gilead. So the congregation sent 12,000 men of the most valiant, and they commanded them and said, Go and smite the inhabitants of Jabesh Gilead with the edge of the sword, and with the women and the children. But this is the thing that you shall do. Utterly destroy every male and every woman that has uh, had relationships with a man. And they found among the inhabitants of Jabesh Gilead 400 young virgins that had not known a man by lying with any male. And they brought them unto the camp to Shiloh, which is in the land of Canaan. And the whole congregation sent some to speak to the children of Benjamin, who were still down there at the rock Rimmon, and to call them peaceably unto them. And Benjamin came again at that time, and they gave them the wives which they had saved alive to the women of Jabesh Gilead. And so... 
uh, there still wasn't enough. There were four, 600 guys and only 400 gals that they were able to take in this nefarious way. But again, you see, how without law and without a king, people can justify all kinds of evil. Beware of the justification of evil. And one of the weakest of all justifications is God made me this way. Beware of the justification of evil. Because evil cannot be justified. And there is no justification for this horrible action. Sending down 12,000 men to wipe out Jabesh Gilead, kill all of the people that were there, the women, the children, save only alive the young virgins. Bring them back. Totally wrong. They're still missing 200. So what they do is equally wrong to supply the 200. The people were still sorry for Benjamin because the Lord had made a breach in the tribes of Israel. Then the elders of the congregation said, What shall we do for the wives that remain, seeing that the women are destroyed out of Benjamin? They said, There must be an inheritance for them that are escaped of Benjamin, that the tribe not be destroyed out of Israel. Howbeit, we made a vow, and so we can't give them our daughters. Because we said, Cursed is any man who gives his daughter to be married to a Benjamite. So they said, Behold, there's a feast of the Lord in Shiloh every year in the place that is on the north side of Bethel, on the east side of the highway that goes up from Bethel to Shechem, and on the south of Labona. Therefore they commanded the children of Benjamin, saying, Go and lie in wait in the vineyards. And watch, and behold, if the daughters of Shiloh come out to the dance, to dance in the dances, then you come out of the vineyards and catch every one of you a wife of the daughters of Shiloh to go to the land of Benjamin. And it shall be when their fathers or their brothers come unto us to complain, that we'll say unto them, Be favorable unto them for our sakes, because we reserve not to each man his wife in the war, for you did not give unto them at this time that they should be guilty. So the children of Benjamin did so. They took them wives according to their number of them that danced who they caught, and they went and returned into their inheritance and repaired the cities and dwelt in them. And the children of Israel departed thence at that time, every man to his tribe, to his family. And they went out from there, every man to his inheritance. And in those days... No king in Israel. Everybody did that which was right in his own eyes. So we see how that, that doesn't work. It's anarchy. And even when you have a council, it can be evil council. What they did was inexcusable. There is no rational justification for the actions of these people. We have to be guided by the law of God. We have to be guided by principles. Unfortunately, man must have laws and must have proper enforcement of laws or else there is a total breakdown in your whole social structure. There was no king in Israel. Everyone was doing right in his own eyes. And we see the results. We see the horrible crimes that were committed against others. The Bible tells us that we should have respect for those who are in authority and have power over us because God has appointed them. Man needs to have laws and man needs to have enforcement of those laws. Can you imagine... If we had no law enforcement in Orange County for one week. If every law enforcement officer decided to just take off. No highway patrol, no sheriff's department, no city police departments. No law enforcement for a whole week. No 
none of you would be safe. Driving home tonight would be the most frightening experience of your life. Because people are crazy. We need to be protected against ourselves. I was driving on Christmas Day and I saw a law enforce, enforcement officer and I prayed for him. I said, oh God, bless that fellow. He probably would like to be home with his family today enjoying Christmas, but yet because of people's stupidity, they don't have enough sense to protect themselves. We have to pay him to watch over us, to make us conform to the law, which are there for our own safety and for our own protection. We need to be governed by principles. And those who have come to Jesus Christ have become subject to the principles of the gospel of Jesus Christ. But laws are for people with no principles. Paul the Apostle said that we are to love one another, even as we love ourselves. And if, if you are governed by the principle of love, you need no law. Against such there is no law. If you have a real love and concern for the person next to you, as much as you have for yourself, you would need no law at all. You don't need anybody to tell you to you know, not hurt him or not take from him or whatever. Laws are for the unlawful. And it's necessary part of our society. Israel was in bad shape. And yet, God still owned them as his people. What is true of Israel is, I'm afraid, true of much of the church. It's in bad shape. Everybody seeming to do their own thing, what's right in their own eyes. How we need to wait upon God and how we need to seek God. Out of all of this malaise, we're going to get another story next week. And in this next story, we're going to see in the midst of the civil and religious confusion, God was working. And that's always comforting to know, God is working. Though the scene oftentimes looks rather desperate and hopeless, God is at work in the hearts and lives of those that are yielded to him. May our hearts and lives be yielded that God might be working in us in these days of moral corruption and decay. The beautiful story of Ruth, one of my favorite books of the Bible, and we'll be studying Ruth next week. And, and it's great to see that in the midst of, of national moral decline, God is at work. Shall we pray? Father, we thank you that you are at work. And we pray that you would work in our hearts, Lord, in these days. Lord, we are so prone to react against the evil that we see. We desire to react against the evil. 
Lord, there are so many times when we would like to take justice into our own hands. And we would like to bring judgment upon the transgressor. But Lord, help us that we would not just react to a situation, but that we would seek your will, your way, your plan, your mind. And may we become the instruments, Lord, through which you might work your work in a sad and corrupted world. Help us, Lord, that we might be the salt of the earth. Help us, Father, that we might be the light of the world. And may we, O oh God, bow our knee before King Jesus, and may we follow him. In his name we pray. Amen. The final countdown of the old year. But God's going to give us a new one to serve him. And I pray that God will be with you as we are in a time of looking back and looking ahead. Looking back on the past blessings and work of God, but looking ahead to yet even a greater work of God's Spirit in our church, in our lives, in our community. And may we become God's instruments, following His will, fulfilling His plan to reach Orange County. May we wait upon God that he might show us his method by which he has designed to reach this community for Jesus Christ. And then may we be instruments that he can use. And may God bless you as you serve him. May God guide you. May he anoint you. And may we together become a mighty force for God. In Jesus' name.